Good morning and welcome to yet another session where we are discussing the seminal novel by Rushdie, Midnight's Children. This is a novel which can be read from multiple perspectives and if you survey the secondary material about the novel, you will also realize that many things have been written about this novel, many interpretations are prevalent and this is a novel which lends itself to different frameworks and lends its, itself to be interpreted in multiple ways. As Rushdie himself has uh, noted that in the West the people tend to read Midnight's Children as a fantasy, whereas in India people think of it as a realistic uh, work, almost as a history book. And this is extremely interesting because it allows people positioned at different vantage points to look at this work from different ways, which is why individual readings and individual responses to this work they continue to interest us and illuminate our own understanding of this work. And Rushdie was very conscious of the kind of uh, influence that his work had and continues to have on the subcontinent, especially in the uh, preface that he wrote uh, in the 2005 edition to Midnight's Children. This was after uh, Midnight's Children was declared as the winner of the Booker of Bookers he very directly talks about the lasting influence that Midnight's Children has had on the subcontinent. And here he also talks briefly about the uh, literary risk that he had undertaken by talking about uh, the various events related to Indira Gandhi and emergency and how eventually he realized that that has proved to be worth it. And it is in this context that in, I invite you to listen to yet another interpretation of Midnight's Children to showcase how the novel continues to be extremely relevant even today after decades of its original publication. To corroborate this, I read to you from this preface written by Rushdie in 2005. He says, the fact that Midnight's Children is still of interest 25 years later after it first appeared is therefore reassuring. And he winds this up by noting, like all novels, Midnight's Children is a product of its moment in history, touched and shaped by its time in ways in which its author cannot wholly know. I am very glad that it still seems like a book worth reading in this very different time. If it can pass the test of another generation or two, it may endure. I will not be around to see that, but I am happy that I saw it leap the first hurdle. So, Midnight's Children being a product of its moment in history, it is important to revise and look at that moment and interpret and reinterpret that moment from multiple perspectives at different points of time, which is what uh, Mahima, one of her students, will be trying to do today through her presentation on Midnight's Children, where she will be looking at some of the elements which were of interest to her. She will be showcasing some important, significant uh, scholarly work, which has also enabled the different kinds of interpretations which are currently available. I again encourage you to be familiar with the original text the novel Midnight's Children to be able to understand and appreciate these discussions in a better light. I invite Mahima to discuss in detail about this novel and also share some of her insights. Good morning everyone. Today I am going to do a presentation uh, continuing what Abanna did last day on Salman Rushdie's uh, Booker Prize winning novel Midnight Children. So my objectives are basically to take you through uh, uh, some themes of post-colonialism which is present in the novel and bring out the binaries in the novel and also to talk to you about the extensive symbolism that is present. Uh, we'll start with the post-colonialism. So post-colonialist uh, writings are basically those that uh, came after the colonizers left the country and it is written by the people of the colonized country and deals with various issues that are uh, prominent for a country that has just been left by these colonizers. So uh, the first aspect is uh, the novel. It is placed between two antagonistic cultures 
by which it tends to create an intermediate space. The space uh, consists of very ambivalent cultures and uh, this theme is not the most prominent theme in the novel but it is evident in some places. This uh, sentence it is said by William Methwell before he leaves country he talks about uh, India's independence. Uh, he is talking to Ahmad Sinai. He says, never seen the like, hundreds of years of decent government, then suddenly up and off. You will admit we weren't all bad, built your roads, schools, railway trains, parliamentary system, all worthwhile things. Taj Mahal was falling down until an Englishman bothered to see it. In the beginning, Ahmad Sinai moves to Methwell's estate, which uh, he leaves behind and uh, he asks the new residents to keep everything as is, not even to remove the wardrobes. So, Salim is born in a place which is not truly his parents but which is also not what belongs to the British anymore. Uh, next, uh, it is obviously presented from an Indian point of view even though he is half British biologically. It uh, shows you what uh, happens in India through the uh, native experiences and it especially deals with events like partition. Partition which is an important uh, part of fragmentation which is mostly uh, present in post-colonial writings and also emergency. Next let's talk about magical realism which Abanna has already talked about. He inculcates elements of magic into a realist setting and uh, in the novel there are 1001 children uh, who had been born at midnight and intensity of their powers uh, varies between how, uh, how much distance they have from their birth to midnight. Also there is the uh, aspect of food. Food is very central in the novel. It begins uh, with him narrating the story in a pickle factory and also he uh, talks about how people who prepare the food puts in their emotions to the food which gets transported to the uh, consumers and affects their actions and lives. Example is mother, sister, Alia. When they move to her house, she is jealous because Ahmad Sinai was originally supposed to marry her but then meets Amina and marries her. Uh, so the food she prepares are very tasty but she pours in her jealousy into it by which Salim says that her mother gets scared of monster pregnancy uh, and Ahmad Sinai uh, uh, encounter huge losses in his towel factory and uh, that leads to the family's decay in the end. Also, Salim initially has the power of telepathy, he can read minds, he can go understand past experiences of the person but uh, after he has a surgery, he has uh, no surgery with something as simple as that, he loses his power and but then he gains another power which is not as grand but uh, uh, the olfactory power he can he has a very acute sense of smell he can even smell emotions and what people are feeling uh, next is imitation this is a quote from the location of culture by Homi K. Bhaba. He says that colonial mimicry is the desire for a reformed, recognizable other as a subject of a different that is almost the same but not quiet. By which he means that for this, uh, this mimicry is constructed around ambivalence. For it to be really effective, uh, you have to know that it is not exactly the same. This is obviously the imitation of the colonized, of the colonizer. And uh, first we can see cocktail hours, when Methwell leaves, he asks Ahmad Sinai to continue the tradition of cocktail hours and uh, every day at 6 p.m. they will gather around and have cocktails. And uh, also when Ahmad Sinai talks to Methwell, he takes on an Oxford brawl. Next we will go to hybridity which is one of the major aspects of a post-colonial novel. In the novel we can see mixing up of everything, Salim Sinai has aspects of Several things, he is uh, biologically half British, half uh, Hindu low cost, but he is brought up in an upper middle class Muslim family. He is well versed in Indian languages and English. Also, uh, it is seen that Salim's these multiple identities are a kind of reflection of India's multiple religions and the conflicts that are going through. He also blends in magic and reality as I already said. And the most common reading of this book considers the magic to be from the indigenous part and the realism to be the western part. Also from the text we can see Amina is the daughter of a highly superstitious mother Naseem and her father renounced religion, he is a doctor, he is a modern man. But still she uh, goes to Ram Ram Seth and believes what he talks about her unborn son 
and uh, then there is Azim versus uh, Thai in the beginning in the uh, valleys. Azim goes to Germany, becomes a doctor, comes back and Thai scoffs at him because now he analyzes everything with his stethoscope instead of his nose. So we could see that Azim is supposed to represent progress while Thai is uh, a representative of changelessness. And also there is uh, Salim who is an educated narrator while uh, who is narrating to Padma who is illiterate and uh, it's, he says that she connects him with that world of ancient learning and sorcerer's laws so despised by most of us nowadays. Uh, this is a quote from the book. He is talking about India, a mythical land, a country which would never exist except by the efforts of a phenomenal collective will, except in a dream we all agree to dream. It was a mass fantasy shared in varying degrees by Bengali and Punjabi, Madrasi and Jat, and would pr periodically need the sanctification and renewal which can only be provided by rituals of blood. The next aspect is very obvious, it is miscegenation, it uh, as given it is a mixing of different racial groups through marriage or uh, sexual relations and Salim is the example of uh, this aspect, he is born of an uh, affair between William Ethwold and uh, Vanita the wife of V. Willy Winky. But most people are not aware of that fact until he is about 11 or 12 and Mary Pereira confesses. This is what Padma says when he reveals that he was not uh, truly the son of his parents. He, she says, what are you telling me? You are an Anglo-Indian, your name is not your own. And uh, he defends himself saying that he is Salim. He was not born of his parents, but he was brought up by them. The next aspect is diaspora. So uh, here we can see the attempt of the people for self-definition and a quest for identity. The people either search for identity in their own country or start to consider the rest of the people as another. This leads to them standing between cultural assimilation and cultural alienation and they tend to take a, a strategy of an excessive belonging as in uh, like uh, the Reverend Mother she keeps telling everyone she wants to go to Pakistan and buy a petrol pump. Also. The narrator uh, uh, Salman Rushdie, he, he was born in Bombay, then he moved to Pakistan and Britain. So you could say that he belonged to all these places, but he never truly belonged to <coughs> any of them. Just like Salim Sinai, he, he is born in Bombay, he moves to Pakistan and Bangladesh and he never really uh, settles anywhere until he uh, comes back to Bombay into the pickle factory. The next is aspect of post-colonial feminism. The book is not really a feminist book, but there are so many characters that are very relevant to his life and his story like his grandmother Naseem, mother Amina, his Aya Mary Pereira, sister Jamila, his <coughs> wife Pavadi, the witch, the listener Padma and the widow. What we can see is that the women in the novel exist in relation to him. They make him and he in turn also make these uh, women. Mary is the very reason that uh, this entire thing happens. He grows up in uh, the Sinai family. But there are some aspects which we could consider like uh, when the freeze affects Ahmad Sinai and all his assets are frozen. Uh, he does nothing and just sits at home drunk and Amina takes it upon herself to m go to the race courses and win money so that they could win the case and get back all their belongings. Also there is this aspect that most characters are made uh, blameworthy by Salim like Amina is not faithful to her husband she goes to meet her ex-husband Nadir Khan in a uh, cafe and uh, which makes him really angry and he he plots revenge against his mother. Then there is Mary, uh, of course she exchanged the babies and that is considered a sin. And Parvati, uh, she has illegitimate child with Shiva. And also these women also receive punishment in a way. Uh, like uh, the other character, Leela Sabarmadi, she has an affair. Uh, she gets, Salim sends an anonymous letter to her husband who goes and shoots her and her lover. This was a way for Salim to scare his mother into stop seeing Nadir Khan and it works actually. And then Parvati, she gets killed. Uh, Mary is constantly haunted by the ghost of uh, Joseph de Costo and uh, her husband who died. She finally confesses when she mistakes somebody else for uh, him. Also uh, the main Padma who is the listener inside the story is also a woman. Next we will go to the binaries present in the novel. So uh, Salim uh, was born in uh, this Methwell's estate. He was 
uh, reasonably rich and it is said that he wore really good clothes, his co hair was always combed. But then he ch a lot of misfortunes fall across him and he moves to this uh, magician slum and he lives in sheds with Parvati who he marries. So there is this aspect of creation and destruction. This is said by Salim, Midnight has many children, the offspring of independence were not all human, violence, corruption, poverty, general chaos, greed and pepper pots. Salim is uh, said to have in a way created India by his actions and also he created the Midnight Children's Conference which Shiva destroys, Shiva the like the god of destruction is uh, supposed to personify destruction. Salim as opposed to Shiva uh, uh, personifies Brahma but also uh, in spite of creating so much destruction Shiva has a lot of illegitimate children across India also in turn being a part of the creation process. Then there is the aspect of one and many. Salim a single person is supposed to represent the whole of India and he is constantly trying to uh, draw parallels between his life and what is happening to India and even trying to uh, show us how what he did affected what happened in India. Then uh, there is the uh, East West aspect that we already talked about the hybridity, how he grows up as an Indian but he is also half British. Uh, then the most noteworthy aspect is uh, that of orphan and multiple parents. This He says this, my inheritance includes this gift, the gift of inventing new parents for myself whenever necessary, the power of giving birth to fathers and mothers. So he, his mother dies in childbirth and his father has already moved away but his we believing key should have been his foster father who brought up Shiva but then he also dies so he is an orphan. But then he has his the Sinais who brought him up. Then there is Mary Pereira who he considers a second mother. Uh, his uh, uncle and aunt uh, who Hanif and Pia who has uh, who can't have children but take him as a son. Then uh, there is Major Zulfikar who gets embarrassed by his son and kind of in a way adopts uh, Salim as his own son. There is a lot of symbolism in the novel that continues in the beginning. Till the end, these images keep coming up repeatedly and explicitly. Uh, so there is the silver spittoon and spittoon is a bowl that is used for spitting these uh, betel nut juices. And what I, from what I read, it is, a, it is an object of common people. But in the novel, uh, the Rani of Kuchnahi, she has a really elaborate, intricate uh, silver spittoon in which she invites people to play the game called uh, hit the spittoon and this silver spittoon is uh, given as a gift to Nadir Khan on his wedding which Amina takes and then Salim carries everywhere. This is also the object that gives him amnesia when the bomb uh, hits his house. He's outside and it hits his head and uh, when he wakes up this is the only object that connects him to his past and he carries it till it is buried in when the magician slum is destroyed. Uh, we could say that the silver spittoon is something of the masses but it came from the rich people just like Salim who was born to a low caste Hindu mother and uh, who should have lived in poverty but he is brought up by a, a rich family. Then there is this perforated sheet by which the novel actually begins. This is what happens uh, to Adam Aziz. Uh, he was uh, no forever into that middle place, unable to worship a god in whose existence he could not wholly disbelieve. Permanent alteration a whole. This whole is shown throughout the novel present in various human beings. So uh, if we talk about the perforated sheet uh, in the beginning, it is uh, through which Adam sees parts of Naseem and falls in love with parts of her but not uh, the whole of her and the marriage doesn't really work out very well. Also in the after that in during uh, Salim uh, his own parents life uh, it is metaphorical. Amina only loves Ahmed partly he she is never unable to love him completely. Also then uh, it again comes back in the form of a, a heavily embroidered sheet uh, with Jamila Singer, her sister, she, uh, she uses while she performs to hide her face from the masses. In Jamila's case, uh, she is known to push away people who confesses their love to him just like Sony in the beginning. So uh, even uh, when 
Salim tells her that he loves her. He uses it as a kind of protection against everything and the people who love her. This uh, hole comes back again and again as a metaphorical hole within the character. For Adam Aziz, it was the hole created by the lack of religion. Amina, when Nadir Khan left with the lack of love. Then uh, there is chutneys and pickles. So this is what he says in one of the last chapters. Uh, the feasibility of the chutneyfication of history, the grand hop of the pickling of time. So what I read was that chutneys is an attempt at preservation. They keep the ingredients as unchangingly to the uh, present and pickling is supposed to change the reality of the ingredient and uh, make new products. Uh, I'm not sure if that is exactly right with the sentence. Also knees and nose which uh, he talks about in the beginning and which is said by Ram Ram Seth about the child Amina is going to have. A nose is described as a place where the inside and the outside meet and uh, also in the beginning uh, the boatman Ta he is, is tells uh, his uh, grandfather uh, um, Salim's grandfather Adam that he has a, no a nose to start a family on and uh, he said to lose his religious belief when sh uh, he hits his nose and there is blood. Uh, Ahmad Sina, uh, he is described as a man who cannot follow his uh, nose. He has no sense of direction and he is supposed to always uh, make uh, bad decisions and encounter huge losses everywhere. He is also an alcoholic and tend to distance himself from everything. So uh, Salim himself got his power from the nose and loses it uh, through that simple surgery. And uh, he is supposed uh, through his nose connects the outside world inside his head. So uh, when it comes to knees, it is as opposed to the passive nose which just uh, connects and analyzes. Knees actually take action. Knees is used to represent Shiva who has these huge enormous uh, knees by which he chokes people to death. They are active as opposed to uh, the nose. Uh, this is my bibliography. Thank you.